You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel. I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. You're watching a Bible Answer, which is dedicated to answering your questions from the Word of God. We have three gospel preachers with us to do just that. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. Hello, I'm Sidney White. I'm the preacher for the Gardner Church of Christ in Martin, Tennessee. I'm David Lemons. I preach for the Maple Hill Church of Christ near Benton, Kentucky. I'm Brad Brewer. I preach for the Bethel Church of Christ in Martin, Tennessee. We're grateful to these brethren for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. Now our first question goes to Brother Brewer and the person asks, Are Enoch and Elijah in heaven? Brother Brewer. Well this is inter an interesting question because it concerns two people uh, that have uh, something in common, uh, something very special in common as far as their uh, biblical references are concerned. Uh, these are the two individuals that did not experience physical death. And I want to read a couple of passages for you uh, that have something to do with, uh, with them. Of Enoch, we read this in Genesis 5 and verse 24. We read that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. We also read in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5 that by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. And then of Elijah we read this in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11, And it came to pass, as they went still on, and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them asunder, and Elijah went by a whirlwind into heaven. Now one of the things that I think is good for us to think about as we kind of begin discussing this question is that the word heaven is used in the Scriptures in at least three different ways. And I want to mention those to you very quickly uh, as we think about this. First of all, sometimes when you read the word heaven, that's going to refer to the atmosphere of the earth, uh, the area where the clouds are, that area that we can see uh, from, uh, from our standpoint upon the earth. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 8 would be an example of that. Another way that word is used is, would be that, that area that's outside of our atmosphere. We might call it space. Uh, where the planets and the stars and the moon and those sort of uh, celestial bodies might, might be. Uh, Genesis 15 and verse 5, for instance, uses that word uh, with that kind of a, a reference. And then there's also that place, of course, where God dwells. Uh, first, or 2 Corinthians, rather, chapter 12 and verse 2. And uh, obviously many other places in the Bible are going to make reference to heaven, uh, talking about that place where God and the spiritual beings dwell. So as we get into this question, recognize that whenever you read that word heaven, you've got to be able to tell from the context of whatever passage that might be, which of those uh, different usages that particular word is, is referring to in that case. But I want to discuss this question from this kind of perspective. You know, the Bible is very clear that there are designated abodes, different type of abodes that exist for the different states of man. Now I want to explain what I mean by that. First of all, there's the abode where we're going to dwell in our physical state. Uh, those of us that are participating in this program, those that are watching this program right now, we are in the physical state. Uh, we are still inhabiting our physical bodies. And so we understand that God created this world such that it would be uh, conducive for the sustaining of this physical body. And so as long as we remain within this physical body, this is where we're going to, to abide. Second, there's the abode for the spirit after we die. You know, once we die and once the spirit separates itself from the body, that's the biblical definition of death, by the way, when the spirit has separated itself from the body. We know that these physical bodies will decay upon this earth. They, uh, they'll return to the dust from whence they came, if you will. But our spirits will go to that temporary dwelling place that we often refer to as, as Hades. 
It's a place that was created by God to house these disembodied spirits, that is, uh, these spirits that are no longer restricted, no longer bound by the physical body. And those spirits will go to that place and remain in that place until the time when our Lord returns and the judgment takes place. You know, the, the most comprehensive description of that place, perhaps, is found in Luke chapter 16, as Jesus makes reference to that place in discussing the rich man and Lazarus. It's only after the judgment that the righteous will be allowed into that place where God dwells, that, uh, that, that, that place called heaven where God and the spiritual beings dwell, and the disobedient will be cast into everlasting punishment. That's that place where they'll be separated from God for all of eternity. Now the scriptures also teach that only one man has gone up into heaven, and that's Jesus. He's the one who, of course, following his, his crucifixion and following His resurrection, ascended back to heaven to be with God the Father from whence He had come. Uh, John 3 and verse 13, for instance, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And so I think that as you consider all of those points and you consider what the Bible has to say about where we're going to go when we die, where those disembodied spirits are going to dwell, all those sort of things, we can conclude that not even Enoch and Elijah who left this world, not even they have gone directly to heaven to be with God where God dwells. Now they didn't die in the usual sense uh, as we know that, that we one day if our lives sustain in, uh, 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 upon this earth for a long enough period of time that we're going to die. But they were changed in some way from their physical state to their spiritual state by God and then they went to that place where all of the disembodied spirits go to dwell. Elijah, as we notice there in, in 2 Kings chapter 2, he didn't ascend to the abode of God, that place where God dwells in that chariot of fire. Instead, he ascended up into the atmosphere. He ascended to a place where those that witnessed that, they couldn't observe him any longer. They didn't know where he'd gone. They just knew that he had gone up and they no longer uh, were able to see him. He was no longer in their presence. Again, 2 Kings chapter 2 and verses 7 and following describe that episode to us. And so it's my estimation, based upon all of these things, that both of these men are now in that place, uh, that place that's reserved for the spirits of all of mankind when they leave their physical bodies behind by virtue of death. They're in that unseen realm where those spirits dwell, and they're there awaiting such time when Jesus returns, and they go to the judgment, and they'll receive their eternal reward. Now in my estimation, that's the best way to consider uh, where those two individuals are at this time. And we appreciate that good question. Thank you, Brother Brewer. And now to Brother White. Person asks, how does the Bible authorize by implication, Brother White? Uh, thank you for the question. And we, before we get into an actual answer of it, I want to talk about a couple of different words. Uh, we, we talk about the word implication. Uh, sometimes we always also talk about the word inference. Something is implied, something is inferred. When we talk about implication, we really are talking about nothing more than, than common sense that we use every day, and we'll illustrate that very shortly uh, in our brief answer to this question. But we understand that the Bible authorizes in, in three different basic ways, by, by command, by example, and by necessary implication, and that's what this question is all about in that regard. By command, we simply look at Matthew 28, where Jesus, in giving the Great Commission, said, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so the commands there are, number one, go, number two, teach, number three, baptize, and number four, to teach again. And so you have the command in that regard. As far as the Bible teaching by example, we have, of course, Acts chapter 20 and in verse 7 as our example today of that. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. Uh, of course, that suggests a couple of things. First of all, it implies that the day of assembling 
was the first day of the week when the disciples came together in that regard. It also implies, or gives the example rather, that that is the day upon which the Lord's Supper is to be offered. The disciples came together to break bread. And so you have the example of when they came together, what they did when they came together. But then there's the matter of necessary implication in that regard. Let me give you a couple of illustrations just from everyday things. For example, if one premise says all men are mortal, another says uh, Socrates is a man, we would conclude that Socrates is mortal. So the implication is stated uh, relative to the premises given. And then we infer from that the conclusion in that regard. Now, if the, if the premise states that some men are tall, Socrates is a man, uh, the implication would not be, nor could we infer, that Socrates was tall. He might or might not be, because one of the premises does not uh, necessarily imply that about him. But then looking at it from a, a biblical perspective, we would think about Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, where after Jesus' baptism, the passage says that He came up out of the water. Well, would that not imply that He went down into the water? And when we infer from that implication that He went down into the water, then we have reached a, a valid conclusion in that regard. Or in Acts chapter 8, uh, where Philip was uh, teaching the eunuch. The Bible says that he began at the same scripture, Isaiah 53, and preached unto him Jesus. And at a certain point, the Bible says they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And of course, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He commanded the chair to stand still. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. In that regard, that would imply that Philip, in teaching the eunuch, preaching unto him Jesus, that he also preached unto him the necessity of baptism. Otherwise, why would the eunuch have said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? I believe it also implies that immersion is the method of baptism employed in that regard. They went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. Now the word baptize or baptizo certainly suggests an immersion, a complete immersion in that regard. But yet if you look up the word baptism in a common dictionary, Webster's or otherwise, you'll find such things as to dip or to sprinkle or things that men have come to attribute to that word baptism, which are certainly not biblical in nature. And so in this regard, uh, baptism is an immersion. They went down into the water. Sprinkling does not command or demand going down into the water. Pouring does not demand both going down into the water, but immersion does. And so you have an implication uh, from which we can infer that uh, baptism in that regard, in that passage, uh, is, um, is immersion. But then you also have, for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, among the qualifications of the elders, the husband of one wife. That implies, and we infer, that one who is an elder must be a married man. Now that, of course, I understand contradicts some religious uh, people of our day, but nevertheless that's what the Bible teaches in that regard. Again, 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, John talks about the coming of the Antichrist. Uh, but then you'll continue reading in that context where he says there are many antichrists. So this is, a, this is a reference to or a prediction of many antichrists, not some particular uh, political leader who's going to come before just prior to the end of the world and the judgment. So by virtue of the fact that he says there are many antichrists, it implies that's not just one man that's different men, and it gives us some ideas in that regard. Now, briefly, those are a few examples uh, that we can cite to show that the Bible does authorize by necessary implication from which we can necessarily infer certain truths in that regard. So again, thank you for the question. 
hopefully that answer will give you some further thought in that regard. Thank you very much. You know, a lot of people confuse those words, implication and, uh, and inference. Uh, in fact, we used to talk about how uh, the Bible authorizes by necessary inference. But in actuality, a, a better way to put it is the Bible authorizes by implication. And uh, Dear Abby once talked about these two words in one of her columns, uh, implication and inference. And she used a baseball analogy to explain it. She says, uh, the pitcher, he implies, and the catcher, he's the one that infers. And then she said, catch. And so the Bible implies, and we infer that which the Bible implies. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer to you a free tract. And our tract today is entitled, The Second Coming of Christ by Brother Perry B. Cotham. If you'd like to have this tract, or if you'd like to have our free at Lesson Bible Correspondence Course, which you may take in the privacy of your home, there are eight lessons involved. We'll send you the first lesson. Fill it out in your Bible study. Send it back to us. We'll send you lesson two. And if you complete all eight lessons, you will receive a certificate of completion. If you'd like any of our free materials offered today, just contact us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net. You can reach us by means of our contact page at www.abibleanswertv.org. Or you can call our toll-free number with your request, and that number is 1-800-436-0463. Back to our questions today. Now to Brother Lemons. The person simply asks, how are Christians sanctified? Brother Lemons. When I think about the word sanctified, I uh, tend to think about the uh, prayer that Jesus prayed in John chapter 17. He's facing the cross. It's very, very near in time. And he is, uh, uh, that cruel cross is lying before him. He spoke in prayer to the Heavenly Father these words in John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so one of the uh, simplest statements ever spoken is found there in that prayer that Jesus prayed to the Father, and yet how very profound it is. Uh, the context is that Jesus is concerned for the future of his disciples, and he knows that they will be united, and they will need to be united to uh, accomplish his will that he's placed in their hands. And so he prays for them that they will be like, they'll be united like he and the Father are united and one. Uh, that's in verse 21. But here in this verse, 17, he asks of the Father that his disciples would be sanctified through the Word of God. So if you study that word sanctified, the original, it's a form of hagiadzo, the verb, and it means to cause someone to have the quality of holiness. To cause someone to have the quality of holiness. And the sense of the word as it is used here is to make as dedicated to God, either in becoming more distinct and more devoted or poorly, uh, morally pure. So sanctification is something that comes about as I become more and more enthralled with and exposed to God's holy word. And if I am to be sanctified, it will be done as I'm exposed to more and more Bible teaching. I do not become sanctified in any other way there's no other way to be sanctified than to love and, and study and understand and then apply the teaching of Scripture to my individual life. When I watch a program like A Bible Answer, it ought to be the case that I am helped to become sanctified and, and to be more holy and be more interested in those things that are eternal in nature. If I want the quality of holiness, I must avail myself of many opportunities to learn and to apply Scripture to my life. And, and surely we uh, uh, can see the importance and the value of seeking more and more opportunities to learn more about God's will, how we might more effectively apply it to our own individual lives. And as we do that, we're blessed with sanctification. Thank you for the good question. Thank you. Now to Brother Brewer. 
This is an interesting question. Would vegetarianism have helped Noah? Why were they allowed to eat meat after leaving the ark, Brother Brewer? And that is an interesting question. Thank you. Uh, reference is made here, I believe, to a passage that's found back in Genesis chapter 9. I want to read this passage for us uh, very quickly, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, why this particular um, permission, if you will, might have been given to Noah at this time. Genesis 9 and verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the field and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Now, this statement, of course, was made by God not long after Noah and his family uh, would have left the ark following that great flood. They made a sacrifice unto the God of heaven, and then God begins to uh, speak and give them certain instructions. This is one of those instructions. Now, this statement is, is very different from the statement that was given to Adam uh, back in the very beginning, back in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29, in that this particular command, or, or permission if you will, uh, specifically grants permission for them to consume animals as part of their diet. Now, if that permission was given to Adam or anyone prior to this time, it's not recorded for us in the Bible. This is the first mention of this, I believe, that you're going to find in the Old Testament. Now, there have been those down through time, I suppose, that have given reasons or tried to propose reasons as to why Noah might have been given this instruction or this permission at this particular time if perhaps it was not given prior to this time. Uh, one person said that perhaps it might have been because uh, the earth having been saturated with water uh, as, uh, it, for that lengthy period of time during the flood and because of maybe some atmospheric changes and, and, and the earth was a very different place following the flood than it was prior to the flood, uh, that maybe it just wasn't uh, quite as conducive to agriculture, would have been less productive agriculturally during the time of Noah than maybe it was prior to that time, at least for a period of time. I don't know that that's the case, but that's one reasoning that's been given as to perhaps why God might have given that, uh, that permission to Noah when it was not given prior to his generation. But for whatever reason there may be, God at this time gives mankind specific permission to eat meat. Now, another interesting aspect of this passage is this. You notice that in conjunction with this permission that God gave to Noah and to others as well, those would, that would have been contemporary to Noah and those that might have followed Noah, to be able to consume meat, right along with that is some protection given for the animals. Because as you notice back in, in this passage we read a moment ago, that God says that fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the field and upon every fowl of the air and upon everyone that, everything that moves upon the earth, upon all the fishes of the sea. And so it seems as though there's this, this natural type of protection given by God such that these animals have now got a, a fear of mankind that perhaps they didn't have prior to the flood. You know, that implies at least to some degree maybe that prior to the flood, the relationship that mankind had with the animal world was very different than the relationship that was, uh, that was in place following the flood. And perhaps the relationship that we have with animals today is very different from the relationship that mankind had with animals prior to that flood. Now, the question here is this, is to whether or not vegetarianism might have helped Noah. Well, I don't know that it really would have necessarily helped Noah in any way uh, if he had been a practicer of this idea of vegetarianism. You know, that's, that's become a, a big thing perhaps in, in more recent generations, those that, uh, that don't want to consume meat. Uh, there are those that don't want to consume anything that, uh, that is associated with animals in any way like eggs and dairy and things like that. There are a lot of different facets that have to do with vegetarianism today. I don't know necessarily that would have been beneficial to Noah. I do believe that if God didn't recognize the value of meat in the human diet, uh, that 
he probably would not have authorized Noah and his family to have consumed those meats as part of their diet in the first place. Uh, I, I think that God uh, certainly has greater wisdom in this area than we do, and He recognizes there's value in both, uh, in both vegetable uh, type things in our diet as well as meats in our diet. And I believe that a good balanced diet is a good thing for our, uh, our, um, our health and, and the way that God would have us to be. But, but in my mind, really the point here I suppose would be this. We've got authorization given to us by God in His Word to consume both plants as well as animals. Now, if a person chooses, uh, as a result of their own free will, whatever they decide to do, uh, not to consume animals, and they want to practice vegetarianism or veganism or whatever the case may be, if they choose to do that, they're not violating a command of God by making that decision. Uh, it's just simply a matter of personal choice. Uh, God has given us authorization to partake of those things. As long as we don't try to bind that decision on someone else, then we've done no harm. We've not violated any kind of command of God. And uh, you know, in my mind, really, I suppose that's, uh, that's kind of my takeaway from this question. Uh, would vegetarianism have, have helped Noah? I don't know that it would have helped him. I don't know that it would have harmed him necessarily. But God saw value in this thing, in the consumption of meat, and He allowed that for Noah and his family and the successive generations. So that's an interesting question, and I appreciate this study. Thanks so much to each of these good brethren for doing a great job today in answering your questions. When I reflect on that last question, I think about Noah and the statement that is made about him in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 7, where the Bible says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. He condemned the world because by comparison the world looks so much more wicked compared to Noah. He was one who found grace in the eyes of the Lord and while they were groping in the dark without the light, he was one who followed the word of God Truly the word was a lamp unto his feet, a light unto his path. And that is the reason why Noah and his family were spared in that universal flood. How important to follow God's word by faith. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer today. And until next time, we hope you have a very pleasant good day. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the Faithful Church of Christ in your area.